What is the future of robotics? What about partnerships? These are all conversations we're going to have with our two esteemed guests this afternoon. My name is Chris Lukey, host of the Manufacturing Happy Hour podcast. My co-host for the week, Jay Call, the Manufacturing Millennial. And I'm excited to introduce Zach Toma of Kawasaki, as well as Victor Duralfi of Robotire. Welcome. And, and maybe and, and welcome can, back. Yes, yes welcome back, you. Victor, from last year. Maybe if you can kick us off, you know, Zach, lead us off, and then uh, Victor, jump in. But, you know, why are you two up here together? What does your partnership look like in general? And we'll get into more depth as we get into it. Sure. At a high level, what you're really looking at is we have a really close partnership with what you've got is the folks that create a well-working, easy-to-use base product. That's our six-axis robotic arm. You know, we've been doing it for 75 years. And then you've got a partner that's taking that technology and not only using it in a somewhat traditional sense, but they're taking it into a forward-looking sense and using it outside of the manufacturing environment. And together, that's kind of where we make that work. Yeah, and you know, we can't do it all ourselves as much as I want to build everything at Robotire, right? We gotta have partners to help us get there, right? And that's been the great part of Kawasaki. Not only is their robot amazing and it looks cool, go check out the new color code. I think it looks very great, Kawasaki Green, right? Um, but how do they help us scale faster, move quicker, be more agile than taking a long duration to build a product, yeah. right? And I think that's one of those things, you brought up scale, right? When we're looking at manufacturing, it's all about you know, time to deployment and scalability of solutions. And that kind of brings into the past, the present, the future. We go back to the past. You guys have one of the coolest displays here at Automate 2023, and that is like the first ever industrial robot, which is just cool, right? It's, it's like 60 years old now. You could program eight positions on the robot, and that was all you got. You know, to, to now, when you look at, you know, the, the present of manufacturing or manufacturing with robots, they were, I would say, the leading technology at one point. It's what made manufacturers, you know, competitive and productive in a global economy. But now you look at the future, well, a lot of times they say the future of manufacturing is digitalization. It's a software key, but how do we then leverage robotics as the solution provider to software? And I, I think what's really cool is, what we're seeing now with what RoboTire has been doing, right, is you guys are bringing, you're solving a problem in the industry that's been around for a long time, and I kind of want you to dive a little bit more into that. But then talking to how is robotics still the background, I guess you say the backbone of what software can build on, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, great question, right? Software is great, you can do a lot of things. However, to do a physical thing, you need hardware. You need something to move something. So in what we've done and we've kind of broken the industrial mold, right? We now have a server controlling a lot of our stuff versus the PLC, right? You can then program faster, you can diagnose faster, you can move quicker, right? But you also have to have a partner that's willing to kind of change up and yeah. shake up the old guard of like, how do you talk to a robot? How do you command a robot? How do you have other aspects, right? And that's a great partnership with Kawasaki. And you know, as we get going and look ahead, like how can, machine learning, how can AI help advance the robots, right? How can it make it better, smarter, quicker from that perspective? And that's what really excites us and keep trying to push that envelope. And to your point, Jake, yeah, I was on here last year. You know, now we have a fully working system. So that system you see in Kawasaki booth is the same four systems that are deployed across the US. So we have one in Arizona, one in Dallas, Texas, one in Pittsburgh, and then one Locally, we're not quite there yet, but there will be one here in Livonia, Michigan in the next week or so where anyone in Michigan can now come see it, get serviced, um, and it's a great opportunity. So for our audience right now who's not familiar with RoboTire, can you kind of give a background of what is the problem that's been out there for a long time and, and what are you guys doing to solve that problem? Sure, and what we're doing is we're building a platform for automated vehicle maintenance. So what we're doing is we're taking robots out of the industrial space in a warehouse and now putting it into a service center. Why is that critical? Go drive by a Bell Tire, go drive by a discount. What do you see? Help wanted signs, right? Mm -hmm. As roboticists, we all say we're addressing the labor shortage, but in auto service, it's critical. Why? Because, hey, we drive that vehicle every day. That vehicle needs to get service. So if there's no one to do it, how are we going to drive? How are we going to get moving around? So what we're implementing is a robotic system to assist with that. Now it's not hey, you're going to take my job away. It's an augmentation of the work. Mm -hmm. Let the robots do the heavy lifting in this first application, 
tire changing. Yeah. So we do, we build a robot to automate the tire changing process. We average 22 minutes for a set of four tires. And that's what we're doing and we're going to continue to add more feature sets after that. And you're, you're making it safer. Like that's the thing, I'm sure you got numbers out there <laughs> of like, um, you know, people probably get back pains, right? They're lifting a 40 pound tire or however much a tire weighs consistently day in and day out, they're going to get back injuries, and I don't know what the work comp industry is at Bell Tire, but you know, when you look at it, why don't people want to be a part of, you know, laborious tasks or in manufacturing? It's because they're physically strenuous on your body, you know, yep. and, and robots can support people in doing that, where they're not taking their job, they're making their job a lot easier. Correct, and it's a, it's a different breed, right? Now you can go be a robot technician and a tire technician, and yeah, a tire tech is the biggest workman comp policy claim a shop owns. And then you also got to remember this, right? We drive around on lug nuts that were torqued by a technician, right? Wouldn't you rather have data that proved that it actually torqued it down to the right value? And that's, again, when you look at it and you see the future of robotics, software. So how do you build a system that can handle a vehicle 1986, like a Toyota Camry, to now a brand new electric Hummer? Right, think about that versatility and the variability, and that's where the new software, software of the future of how to adapt and you know AI to be able to identify things like that, so you're not in a down situation if the robot can't perform, right? So I've got a question um, for you, Zach, because we've yep. been talking a lot about the future of robotics, right? We've talked about software, we've talked about AI. Where do you see the future of robotics going and if you need to use the you know where we are in the present or where we were in the past as a baseline feel free to share that as well but I want to hear some of your thoughts on the future as well yeah absolutely so when I think of where robotics is going in the future I do kind of look at where it's been in the past and I honestly don't necessarily think about robots in the past I think about CNC and G code that's the first thing that comes to mind um, my dad actually put one of the first CNC routers from Japan into, I want to, I can't remember the name of the company, but aerospace manufacturer back in the um, 70s or something. And, you know, back then, that was cutting edge technology, yeah. you know? And you talk to some of the old boy integrators out there and they'll tell you about wiring, you know, soldering together boards on some of the robots when they started coming out. And then you look at the cost of what robots were 30, even 20 years ago, and look at what they are now. Not just that, but look at how ubiquitous they are. Obviously, part of the helping with the cost. When you look at future, this is something near and dear to my part or my heart. I, one of the things that I see is more and more small businesses taking on robotics. Mm -hmm. They're starting to um, not only have the monetary access to it or the ability where the price points come down, so the access point has gotten a little less painful, but there's also more help for them to be able to take what. I think ends up being a bit of a courageous step for them mm -hmm. in starting off on their first automation project. Because let's face that, it's kind of like if you go into anything with, uh, if, you're, if you're adding on to your house or building a new place, you want to make sure your contractor's not going to leave you high and dry. And everybody in this building has got a story of that, if hopefully just one. But um, there are a lot more ways to validate an integrator, a lot more tiers of integrators now that can provide world-class service at kind of mom and pop shop price, if you want to say, if you want to call it that. And that accessibility and um, widespreadness of the use, the familiarity with robotics, the kids coming out of school now, what they can do with PLCs, what they're learning out of high school. You know, we got kids in kindergarten programming little beetles <laughs> and stuff to, you know, it's, it's starting at such a young age and it's such a boon for everybody. It really is. That's, Honestly, and you, and you can fold in software, and you can fold in AI and all that stuff, and you know, kind of ro robots, like I said, Kawasaki, we've been doing this for 75 years, yeah. you know? And uh, old line technology, but you don't reinvent the wheel for a reason. The software is only as good as the hardware to do a physical task, you know? And all those things coming together to just see it get more widespread into more places, you know, RoboTire <laughs> taking it outside of the yeah, manufacturing yeah. environment, interesting ways people are using it. That's really what gets me excited. So, you know, Victor, the next question is kind of going back to you and your story of, of going out there and doing funding, right? You were you were originally in California, right? Yep. In, in San Francisco or? Correct. Okay, in San Francisco, where Chris was from, from as well. And, you know, you, you came to 
the Detroit area, you know, to start off your company. And what's it been like going from a guy who, who you've closed several projects within venture capital and fundraising and all that, and then you started Robo Tire as, as another one. What's it been like working with a robotics company that when you went and you pitched them the idea of like, hey, we're not going to use your robots for machine tending, we're not going to use your robots for material handling, we're not going to use your robots for that, and we're not even going to put it in a factory. We're going to put it inside of a tire changing, you know, and now it's not just Bell Tire or whatever, you're also doing something with DOD, but what was it like, you know, starting that out? And then I guess you could say, what are some tidbits and takeaways you would recommend as looking for a partner to help you be successful. Yeah, I mean, that's, oh God, that's, that's a long story, it right? Why don't you it, like somebody at Kawasaki <laughs> when you ask them, they said, uh, We're gonna need the five you, minute or less version of that yeah. story. Did they give you, you sure you wanna do this? Yeah. <laughs> it's like dating, right? You gotta date a lot yeah. before you get the right partner. But really what it comes down to um, is in that early days, back in 2020 when we started and pitching these guys, it had to be that, you know, Kawasaki was really great. They saw the future. They saw where they wanted to go, right? They saw that, hey, just like a VC, you're gonna gamble on Robotire by putting time and money, Kawasaki's point, time to build this and because there's a bigger step on the end, right? So, you know, in the early days as a startup, you have to find companies and partners that are willing to kind of take that same bet that a VC would make, right? Like, I hope this is gonna work, but if it doesn't, Right, oh well, it doesn't, life goes on, right? That's the same thing of pitching VCs, right? You have to pitch 100 before you get one. Now there's not 100 robot manufacturers for me to pitch, but you know, again, it was, as a startup, being able to clearly speak of what the opportunity is, what the pitch is, and be like, yes, vendor, here's the big opportunity, can you get on this and can you get behind it? And you gotta do your best your best dating, right? Yeah. You gotta try to put on that best dress and hopefully they'll go out, right? From that perspective. You'll get no's sometimes, but it's all right. You, you, know? look, you look good to us. <laughs> what did it feel like being that startup that wasn't gonna just be sitting behind the computer all day coding the latest app, right? You were a startup, it's like, we're gonna be hanging out in the garage. Like, not just like start a company in the garage, <laughs> but like literally that's our business. What was it like, especially being out in San Francisco? Yeah, I mean, in when we were out in San Francisco, it was a lot different. Here, I think there's more of a niche for hardware, right, and robotics. In the Bay Area, yeah, it's like, let's build the next hottest app. Let's get the crazy valuation. Um, but what I think it really comes down to is you got to find people that are truly passionate about hardware, right? So most of my team, we're up to 21 people now. It, every, I love everyone, right? We're in there. We're nitty-gritty. We come home. Half of the guys are dirty, right? Yeah. It's a different environment. But I think people get behind the pitch, the cause, and what we're doing to help actually do, bring robots outside of a factory to actually service a need, right? To help people. And that's what we do as we're building technology is we're building technology to help someone, right? Yeah. And that's really where I think the difference between an app and that is we're building technology to help, right? Yeah. Excellent answer. So when we look at, we're kind of wrapping up some questions here, and I'd love to get some hindsight of where you guys see the industry going. So for your predictions, let's say we're gonna be back in Detroit here in, in two years for Automate. Um, where do you predict the industry being in terms of the adoption of robotics? Do you see a significant change? Do you see you know um, new ways of deploying solutions? Where do you see our industry being in a couple of years? To tell you the truth, I, I think the, tra the trajectory is going to stay at, I mean, it's like my old joke when I go to see customers. Where's the line going? <laughs> Up and to the right. All right, everybody's happy. Tell your VC guys that. Um, I think it's going to keep going that way. At the same time, though, I think it's going to accelerate. Um, and part of that being labor. I hear it in my line of work almost every single day. You can't find people. So I'm expecting to see more exotic applications. I'll bet we see some startups that are taking on even more. I mean, they're following kind of in the trend of the robotire thing. Yeah. How do we not only improve things in the manufacturing setting, how do we do it in the consumer setting, the commercial setting? I mean, you're already seeing some of that. I expect those things to accelerate and I expect to be seeing more of that type of out of the box or what we would traditionally call out of the box type of thinking being deployed or that close to being ready to, de to being deployed even in short order. 
It's one of the best answers we've gotten to that <laughs> question, more exotic yeah. applications. So I look forward to seeing what those <laughs> applications are in two to three years. What about you, Victor? I mean, there's, again, we all run in the startup space. There's a lot of people trying to push the envelope just like we are, right? Bring robots closer to consumer. They can see it. Construction's really hot right now with robotics from that side of the world, not only in the factory, but you know, built on site with that. Um, it just, there's just more of us that are going to keep popping up. And to yeah. the point is, prices come down, robots are more accessible, they're getting easier to program. There's a bunch of other software companies out here that allow me to program robots a lot quicker. So you'll see the adoption grow very yeah. quickly. And a lot of people are going to try, right? Try something and it's okay to fail. If it doesn't, you keep moving on. Yeah. The entry to automation, I would say, is a lot less than what it was five, 10 years yep. ago. And, and, and I think the also the, the willingness to fail <laughs> is, is I would say, a lot, a, a lot more accepted today than what it was, where it was before, you know, we, we, we see inspirations of like what, you know, Elon Musk did with SpaceX, right? Like they don't care if they blow up a rocket, if they're gonna <laughs> learn something. Now granted, we're not saying go crash a robot and make it burn, you know, probably not under your warranty, <laughs> but it's one of those things where um, I, I think they're more willing to, to find new ways to, to learn quicker. Well, yeah, and there's, there's value in the failure, just yeah. like you said, you know, even, even as, as long as you're failing and taking notes, you know, as long as you got your eye on the failure and what went wrong, then there's still that time for the next generation. I can tell we could have this conversation for far more than 15 <laughs> minutes, but we are wrapping up for this segment of uh, our interview. So, hey, Zach, Victor, pleasure to have you on. Great conversation for all of you out there. We will be seeing you really soon.